I think we can all agree that controlling exposure to occupational hazards is a fundamental method of protecting employees. And protecting employees is what drives us as safety professionals. The use of effective controls can help avoid injuries and illnesses, minimize or even eliminate safety and health risks, and ultimately help employers provide workers with safe and healthful working conditions. To help with selecting the most effective control for the specific hazard you're trying to mitigate or eliminate, you can use a hierarchy of control strategy. Hi, I'm Sergio with a a Safety, and in this video, we'll be going over the hierarchy of controls and how you can use this strategy to control exposure to occupational hazards at your workplace. Let's start off by talking about what the hierarchy of controls is. I like to think of it as a tool or a guide that you can use to think of and find different solutions to a problem, or in the world of safety, different controls to a hazard. If we look at the famous inverted triangle containing the different control methods you can use to mitigate a hazard, you will find the five different approaches you can take to control a hazard. Now these controls are listed in this order on purpose, as they are listed from the most effective to the least effective. When we're using the hierarchy of control strategy to control a hazard, we should always try to find a feasible solution by starting at the top of the list and working our way down. It's also a good idea to keep in mind that combining different control measures increases their effectiveness and in a sense, works as a backup plan in case plan A fails. So let's go ahead and put the strategy to use. I'm gonna go through each of the different control methods. I'll provide a summary or a description of what that control method is and then use it in an example. The example we will use to explain each rung in the hierarchy of controls will be the hazard of drop objects, more specifically from heights. Drop objects is a hazard that is often overlooked on a construction site, but poses a significant hazard to those working below others. Even a small tool or piece of material can cause significant harm and even death if dropped from great heights. To give you some perspective, let's go over some falling object statistics that I find very interesting. A solid object dropped from 64 feet will hit the ground in two seconds at a speed of about 43.8 miles per hour. Now that same object dropped at 106 feet will hit the ground in three seconds at a speed of 65.8 miles per hour. An even more fascinating and scary fact is that a two ounce pen dropped from 230 feet has the potential to penetrate a hard hat. Do I have your attention now? Not only will you learn about the hierarchy of controls, but we'll also throw in a bonus of how to control drop object hazards at your work site. Okay, let's get started with the most effective way of dealing with a hazard, elimination. Elimination is physically removing the hazard from the workplace. This is a very straightforward strategy that should be explored and implemented, if feasible, before all other methods. This control is easiest to implement at the design or development stage of a project as it allows designers and planners sufficient time to make needed changes without needing to retrofit processes. If we're exploring the elimination method for drop objects, we look at the actual hazard itself. Is the hazard the act of dropping an object or is it getting struck by a dropped object? Right. It's the blunt force trauma sustained from being struck by the object. So to eliminate this hazard, we can eliminate the presence of workers under those working from heights. This would mean that nobody can be on site while workers are operating at heights. No workers, no hazard of being struck if an object is dropped from heights. However, this is not always feasible. In fact, rarely ever feasible. With so many different contractors on site at one time, someone is bound to walk or work under someone working from heights. So after exploring the elimination option, which in this scenario is not feasible, we explore the next rung of the hierarchy of control, substitution. Ask yourself, can we replace a material or process that poses a hazard with something that isn't hazardous? Can we replace a material or tool that will not cause bodily harm to someone if it is dropped on them from a height? In this case, this would not be a feasible option as they don't make paperweight tools or material that will get the job done. So we can eliminate or substitute the hazard. So we move on to our third best and most effective method, which is engineering controls. When you engineer a solution to a hazard, you physically separate the hazard from the person. This requires a physical change to the workplace or the equipment or tool. The initial cost of engineering controls can be higher than with some of the other methods, but the long-term operating costs are frequently lower. This is usually because most engineering controls are only required to be installed once. Of course, they should be inspected and maintained as necessary. An example of an engineering control to protect an employee from dropped objects would be to install tow boards at the bottom of a guardrail, install safety nets to catch dropped objects before they strike someone, and install and use tool tethers. Now, which engineering controls you decide to implement will depend on the type of tool or material you're working with. Keep in mind its weight, size, shape, etc. For example, a safety net won't stop a screwdriver or a screw as it can easily fly right through one of the net openings. While design engineering controls can be highly effective and does not rely on an individual behavior for them to work, unlike administrative controls. Which brings us to the next option in the hierarchy of controls, 
Administrative controls. Administrative controls essentially change the way people work. The method limits exposure to the hazard rather than removing it. Because the hazard is still present, this method is considered less effective than the previous three that we've mentioned. Although administrative controls can be used to control employee exposure, they are prone to human error and cannot always be relied upon to reduce exposure. Administrative controls include employee training, signs and warning labels, and procedural changes such as work schedules and rotating workers. An example of an administrative control for dropped objects would be roping off the area, if possible, where drop object hazards may exist. Now this measure will only work if workers recognize the warning and stay out of the area. Another example would be to train employees on safe work practices when working at heights, specifically on preventing dropped objects. This training may include safe work practices ranging from keeping materials at least three feet from the leading edge, to never hanging objects over a guardrail. Try to be specific with your scope of work when it comes to this training. The effectiveness of administrative controls is very dependent on individual behavior. That's why it's best to combine this method with engineering controls and PPE in case human error does occur. And finally, the last method for controlling a hazard, personal protective equipment, or PPE for short. PPE should always be the last line of defense. Always avoid using PPE as a standalone control measure as it can result in workers being exposed to the hazard if the equipment fails. PPE includes gloves, hard hats, safety glasses, high visibility clothing, and other special protective equipment such as safety harnesses and respirators. Now to protect against dropped objects, hard hats will be your best friend. Just be sure you know the limitations of them. As we mentioned earlier, even a two ounce pen can penetrate a hard hat from 230 feet. So it's important we understand those limitations. PPE should be used as an added protection and in combination with engineering and or administrative controls. Serving as that last line of defense, PPE can protect employees if any of the other control measures fail, to a certain extent, of course. As we wrap this video up, I wanna share a quote with you all. Safety is not the absence of incidents. It is the presence of safeguards. So ask yourself, are you good or are you just lucky? I hope this video has given you a better understanding of what the hierarchy of control strategy is and how we can use it as a guide to seek the most effective control measures to protect our workers from occupational hazards. As a quick recap, the five rungs of the hierarchy of control from most effective to least effective are one, elimination, physically removing the hazard from the workplace. Two, substitution, replacing a material or process with another that is considered less hazardous. Three, engineering controls, isolating the worker from the hazard, usually requiring a physical change to the workplace or equipment slash tool. Four, administrative controls, changing the way people work. And five, PPE, usually used as a last line of defense and in combination with engineering and administrative controls for added protection. If you have any further questions about this strategy and how you can use it at your workplace, or need any assistance with any aspect of your safety program, feel free to contact us using the information provided below. We'd love to hear from you guys in the comments as well. What does your process consist of when mitigating workplace hazards? Be sure to follow us on all social media platforms to stay updated with our latest safety tips and tricks. And as always, until next time, be safe and thank you.